Industrial History. I'm Kara Mossinger, President and CEO. Uh, we're delighted to have you here as we uh, celebrate Anthracite Mining Heritage Month. There's a number of programs being offered in the area, institutions and museums throughout the Anthracite region here in Northeast Pennsylvania. And we're thrilled to have a special presentation here today by Dr. John Smith on the role of the Lehigh Valley Railroad in the anthracite industry. John, an associate professor emeritus at Lehigh University, began his career as an engineer. His technical background has provided him a unique perspective on the history of technology and industry. After receiving his PhD from the University of Delaware in 1986, he went on to become a new coming fellow in business history at Harvard Business School from 86 to 87. John joined the faculty of Lehigh University in 87. He has been recognized for his notable work on the research and development at the DuPont Corporation. He received the Newcomen Prize in Business History for Best Book Published in America and is on the editorial board of American Chemical Society Books. We're thrilled today to have Dr. John Smith on behalf of the Anthracite Mining Heritage Month to examine the evolution of the Lehigh Valley Railroad from a regional railroad to being part of a national network. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Well, I have to thank all of you for coming out today. Uh, I was rooting for the Eagles last week because I figured if they lost, and they were playing today, there would probably be nobody here. So <laughs> I was cheering for them. Um, what I'm going to say today in a short period of time is going to be relatively, you know, incomplete. Uh, but I do want to point out, uh, there, is a, a, there is a pretty good um, history of the Lehigh Valley Railroad by Robert Archer. It was published in the 70s. It's lavishly illustrated. Um, it doesn't have any footnotes, but I read all the annual reports of the Lehigh Valley Railroad, and I, you know, it, it's accurate. Uh, the information in here is good, even though he didn't, he didn't uh, include any footnotes. The other one, if if you're really brave, uh, there was a book published by a British uh, a geographer called the Pennsylvania Anthracite Coal Industry, 1860 to 1902. It has everything you would ever want to know about this industry. Um, and, and, I mean, he did an incredible amount of research. But the, the thing is weird about geographers, they do wonderful research, but they can't write. Uh, you know, so really, don't even read the book, just look at the tables. But this, this, the spooky thing about this is, you'll be reading along in the middle of a dry paragraph, and all of a sudden he drops a bomb on you. And you go, wow, man, you got your best conclusion buried here in the middle of a sentence on, you know, page 163. Uh, but it's, a, it's really quite a remarkable, um, uh, guy did an amazing amount of work and, and collected a, a huge amount of data. All right, so um, let's see if I got this thing. Uh, okay. So. So I just press this to, yes. to go for it. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about today really is that um, sort of the evolution of the, of the anthracite coal industry um, in, the, uh, in the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, coal con I called it the coal conundrum because like a lot of other businesses, there were some problems uh, that were very difficult uh, that the people in this industry faced. <coughs> <laughs> Which I just press down. Oh, that one. There you go. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to start this with the. Um, in, in 1873, a reporter from the New York Times went to mock junk, um, and uh, you know the the New York Times always thought of itself as a fairly sophisticated. Um, paper, and they uh, a little, they made a little bit of, uh, I don't know, snarky, you might say, uh, attitude about what they found. Um, and of course, they the made a visit to Mock Chunk, and he said uh, the, the headline being where pious people thereabouts pray for cold weather. Uh, because one of the 
the biggest demand really for anthracite coal was in home heating. Um, and so they always, in order to have the coal industry doing well, they wanted to have uh, cold weather. Uh, and of course, the next thing they asked him, apparently everyone he went to in town said, have you been in the switchback? Have you seen the switchback? Have you ridden the switchback? Um, and he became quite fascinated with it. He rode it and he really thought it was, uh, it was really a fun thing to do. And of course, probably most of you already know about this. Um, you know, there is no coal uh, in, in Mock Chunk. The coal is 10 miles away. Um, and then the 1820s and 30s, they came up with a very clever way to get the coal from the mine down in the river. Um, they would, uh, on the right here at Mount Pisgah, they would use a stationary steam engine at the top to drag the cars up to the top of the hill. Then they would coast downhill until uh, they got to Mount Jefferson where they were holed up to the top, filled with coal, and then they could coast to 10 miles all the way uh, back to uh, Jim Thorpe or to Mock Jungle. Um, it was a very ingenious uh, uh, way to, to move the coal. Uh, now, this switchback was very popular. Uh, I, I confess my, my hobby in my, um, in my retirement has been collecting stereo views. Um, there are literally thousands of them listed every day on eBay. Um, and one of, the, one of the popular stereo views uh, that you see quite a few of is of the switchback. Um, it, was, uh, it was pretty well known across the nation, uh, particularly as uh, after they replaced it with the railroad to haul the coal, it became an amusement ride. Uh, and here's a, here's a, you know, here you are at the top. Uh, I guess there's been some debate about whether this was the first roller coaster or not. Um, it actually didn't go very fast uh, when you rode down it. Uh, and I see these ladies had their hats on. There was a story I read though that there was a guy once who, he needed to get down the hill really fast. So he just jumped on some kind of cart and he let gravity do the work. And apparently he hit about 40 miles per hour um, on the way down, which isn't exactly roller coaster speed. Then that was fast. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but, the, but the remarkable thing about this article uh, that he wrote for the Times is that he actually, Asa Packer talked to him. Uh, you know, Asa Packer was not known for, uh, you know, for, for seeking much publicity. Uh, when he ran for governor in 1869, he, uh, he actually uh, talked to the press twice, and it's only because the newspaper men like, caught him walking down the street. And at one point, Packer said, well, I'm on my way to Hazleton on the train, and the reporter said, okay, I'll ride with you, um, in order to get a story out of Packer. So, he asked Packer, so, so the amazing thing, uh, you know, that, there, that during the busy season in the winter, 25 to 1,000 to 30,000 tons of coal a day being shipped out of, out of uh, Mock Chunk. Um, and then what he says here that, uh, and of course also that their passenger and the general freight do not amount to much. I mean, this is an anthracite railroad um, and it says the two lines of railway have about 60,000 cars always on the track uh, as it takes seven or eight hours to make the round trip to New York and back, which I calculated probably is like maybe 20, 25 miles per hour that these trains were going. Um, and that would be, thus there would be 100 trains, each of 100 cars passing down the valley every day at the rate of one every 15 minutes. I just find that incredible, uh, the total quantity of, I mean, the scale of this industry at this point is quite remarkable. Um, now, maybe a little bit on the other side here, I have a friend of mine uh, who's written a book called Killed by the Train, um, where she went through the Bethlehem newspaper and literally got every article about someone who was killed by a train. Uh, thousands of people were killed by these trains, and one of the when you read these newspaper accounts, in the Victorian age, they really like to give the most horrifying, grisly <laughs> accounts that you could possibly imagine about 
body parts strewn down the track. You know, it's, it's really, and what she did in this book is, she basically reproduced all these articles. I mean, it, and she asked me to read it, and after about 10 pages, I said, oh man, I've had enough. I can't, I can't take it anymore. I can't take 250 pages of people being run over, being run over and, and killed by trains. Uh, but a hundred, a hundred trains. It's just amazing uh, the, what what the scale of this industry was by that point. Um, and this is just, uh, you know, a picture of uh, a couple coal trains <coughs> hauling all that coal. Um, and of course, what we know is that, that beginning uh, beginning in the uh, you know in the 1820s and 30s, the anthracite coal business just really took off. Uh, I love this this uh, graphic way of uh, uh, presenting information. This thing here kind of looks like a tree. It actually represents the size of the industry. Um, and it also shows you the various coal fields here. Schuylkill, Wyoming, Lehigh, uh, and how the industry grew between about 1830 and 1880. Um, and of course, these are... Uh, where, where, where was the coal? Uh, these are where the coal fields were. Uh, and it's important here because of the various river valleys. Uh, we have the, uh, of course, we have the Lehigh, we have the Lehigh River. Um, and you can see that the only real coal on the Lehigh River is what was up near Stoddardsville, which was the Beaver Meadows. Uh, the Schuylkill, right at Pottsville. In fact, you know, the. The shortest way and the easiest way to get coal to Philadelphia was from this field, uh, you know, the Schuylkill, Schuylkill field. It was short. Uh, it, it was, uh, and like somebody talked about Girard, there's where Girard made all his money, uh, shipping coal down the, down the Schuylkill River to Philadelphia. And then, of course, there's the giant field underneath the Susquehanna River uh, up in the Wyoming area. Um, and then it's interesting because uh, the next slide here is about the Lehigh Valley Railroad and one of the problems it faced. Um, there isn't much, like I put out, there isn't much coal in the Lehigh River Valley. Uh, yeah? I, I don't know much about it, but would, would Pennsylvania coal goes, should be shipped as far north as Boston and maybe as far south as Baltimore? I mean, where, where yeah, would I'll, the range be? Yeah, I'll, I'll get to okay. my next slide. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> Okay, so the interesting thing and a challenge for the, for the Lehigh Valley Railroad was that there wasn't much coal um, in, their, uh, in their region. Uh, and you can see here that by 1878, uh, most of the coal that they're, they're shipping is coming from Hazleton. Uh, so they have, to, they have to get out of the Lehigh Valley um, in order to get to the coal. And you can see there's a railroad here that goes from the... Uh, from the Lehigh River over at Whitehaven, up over the mountain, um, and then down into the Susquehanna Valley. Okay, so where did the coal go? And of course, this is from the canal era, right? From the, you know, until, you know, the canals were developed first. Uh, the two big markets were really Philadelphia and New York City. Um, and, and anthracite was used for lots of different purposes, but one of the most important markets, as I said before, was home heating. Um, and so, uh, you know, as Philadelphia and New York grew, uh, the demand for home heating uh, grew with it. You know, and it's really interesting to think about, could Philadelphia and New York have grown uh, to the size that it did in the 19th century without anthracite coal? Uh, certainly they couldn't have continued to burn wood. Uh, you know, wood was getting more expensive. Um, you know, the, the forests were getting further away. Uh, maybe they could have gotten coal from England or somewhere, but I really think that the development of this industry really helped lead to the uh, urbanization and the and the commercial and economic development of the United States. Yeah, and so you can see here a great, and this, this is based on volume. A huge amount is going down to Philadelphia. Some of it then, once it gets down to Philadelphia, it was transshipped on the Delaware and Raritan Canal to get to New York. Uh, Another way to get to New York was to go down um, into the Delaware Valley um, and across and down to New York. And then you mentioned Baltimore. Uh, there was a canal built on the Susquehanna 
uh, to go down to um, Avenue Grace, which you can go to Baltimore. Uh, to get to Boston, probably what it would be, it would be transshipped. It would be transshipped from, uh, from New York uh, to Boston. And just one of, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, when, the, when the canal boats got to New York Harbor, um, they had to be unloaded and loaded into ships to sail across the harbor. One of the innovations that Asa Packer made was actually figured out how to put a sailing rig on a canal boat. Uh, so when you got to Jersey City, uh, you didn't have to unload all that coal, uh, put it into a ship that could sail across the harbor. And this way, the coal boats could just, you know, they could, they could put, rig up a sail and sail across the harbor. That little innovation uh, saved an enormous amount of labor. Because stuff was moved with shovels in these era, this era, and uh, really took a lot of uh, of time. Okay, uh, this is just uh, this is actually from an 1838 report um, of the Lehigh Valley uh, of the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company, just showing all the options. Uh, you know, here were all the options to move coal from uh, the coal fields down to uh, to Philadelphia. Uh, the, the vertical axis is the amount of height uh, that you had to deal with, and the horizontal axis is the miles. And again, you can see how this Google, this Google got developed first. Yes. Why was it that the coal was mostly going to Philadelphia, and why was the objective to make coal companies to get the coal out of anyone's industry in Philadelphia? Well, they got it. The, I'm not quite sure. I, well, it was because of energy or was it because of steel making? No, well, I said, well, a lot of it was used for industrial purposes, but probably the biggest market, <coughs> the biggest market was home, was to heat homes, to keep people warm. You know, Benjamin Franklin had invented a nice stove uh, that you could use uh, in order to keep, to keep you warm. And then there's also then there's New York, uh, and I know it was a little it was a little more difficult to get the coal to New York than it was to Philadelphia. I mean, there's one way here is to uh, the Susquehanna River, the Chesapeake, the Delaware Canal, the Delaware and Raritan. I mean, man, you're you're going all the way you're going all the way down the Susquehanna River to Baltimore, going up to Chesapeake Bay, across the the, the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, up the Delaware River. And then this, uh, the Delaware and Raritan Canal, man, that's a, I don't know how much coal was shipped in that. That's a long way to get to New York. Sorry, the canal wasn't there yet. <laughs> what? C&D wasn't there yet. 1829. Yeah, it wasn't there and moved that much coal. It was 1825. But most of it went on scooters and went up. It's all a book on that. Well, it says the Delaware Canal. Well, this yeah. is 1838. And he says well, you're talking it's, about the C and D. It's the C and D in the 18. I think the C and D was built in 18 between 1825 and 1830. I mean, it's not a real hard canal to dig. No, it is pretty lovely. Now, one of the other uh, uh, complicating issues in trying to run a coal company is uh, the complexity of of your of your market. Uh, here we have in 1878. Uh, what the Lehigh Valley Railroad, where all the coal went. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, to New York City, probably the last one, 879,000 tons went to New York City. Uh, one of the interesting things here is that 578,000 tons uh, went to the iron industry. And of course, they loved the iron industry because the, it wasn't so much seasonal as the heating was. They wanted to develop applications, right, that would use coal all year round. I mean, the, they would not just have a big peak of use in the winter, and then during the summer, uh, the market really falls off. Uh, so that really helped. And then there's all these other uh, connections to other railroads, some of which the Lehigh Valley owned and some of which it didn't. Now, with, with 60,000 cars and all this, how do you keep track of all this? <laughs> Uh, you know, it almost seems like you need a computer uh, to keep track of all these cars and uh, where is all this coal going? I mean, it was really a, you know, it was, it was a very, very complicated business. 
Okay, and coal, of course, uh, you know, is a giant machine. Uh, here we see some coal miners uh, going down into the coal mine. Uh, then here they are once, once they're down in the mine. Uh, these are some of the stereo views that I've, I've collected uh, on these industries. Okay, that's, okay, now this one, I put this one here, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, these are just a couple coal miners. The stereo view was taken by a, a, a photographer named Kleckner uh, who worked out of Bethlehem. He's done quite a bit of stuff on, on Bethlehem. This thing sold for $110 last week. Uh, you know, I put in my bid for 10, uh, but, but, but it ultimately sold for $110. Uh, I mean, it's a nice picture, uh, but uh, you know, it's uh, I've never seen it before. Right, here's another one I just I put in here. Uh, you know, this one, uh, another one. This one sold for about $100. Nice picture of Jim Thorpe there. All right. Uh, I've had, a, I, sorry, my, my PowerPoint, I seem not to have gotten the, the final version. Uh, uh, of course, the coal had to go to a breaker, right? And the breaker had to break up uh, the coal into the various pieces. And the other interesting was the market. Uh, the market for coal, there were many different sizes of coal that you needed uh, um, in order to, um, you know, for the various purposes. Uh, you know, if you're going to have like something for an ocean liner, you might have really big pieces of coal, uh, but for home heating, you wanted relatively small ones. So what we have here is a picture of, uh, of, a, of a vibrator here um, in the uh, in the uh, in the breaker that would separate the various sizes of coal. Okay, there's the coal breaker. So I got these things a little out of out of uh, out of order. Uh, there's there's a coal breaker, uh, the coal taken from the mines and created. Now, one of the interesting things I found here is is um, moving all of this coal. Uh, how did you store it? Uh, this is an amazing photograph of Honesdale, Pennsylvania, on the Delaware River. Uh, with these absolutely enormous piles of coal. Uh, and again, the, the snarky reporter from the New York Times said, uh, nor is coal, despite its aristocratic alias, black diamonds, a fascinating object to rest one's eye upon when it is piled in great heaps. So this would be uh, coming down from the coal mine, uh, down to the river, uh, the Delaware River, to be transported to the market. And again, uh, how do they fill the coal cars? Guys with shovels here. I, I find this rather hard to believe that uh, here they are, they're actually filling up the coal cars with guys with shovels. Of course, right here in Bethlehem, uh, you know, we had uh, delivering it to the market. Uh, French Coal Company has been here for quite some time. But one of the interesting things that uh, that, that I found, and what he points out in this book is um, that trying to match the supply of coal to the demand for coal was very, very difficult. Um, and uh, it caused a lot of problems. And basically, it seems that in the late 19th century, they had a just-in-time uh, system. Uh, there were not large places to store coal. So the connection between the mine and the market was pretty tight. Uh, you know, the, the mines had to, to, to mine the coal, process the coal, ship the coal in order to meet the demand at that moment. Did they know what that demand was? Well, mostly not. Uh, they had to guess basically what the demand was. Um, and then I tried to, you know, as a former engineer, I thought, well, the way to, to even this thing out is to um, have storage, have giant storage places in Philadelphia, New York, so that you don't have to have this tight connection. And one of the other interesting aspects of the tight connection is the coal miners didn't work that many days a year. I mean, one of the, one of the big problems for coal miners was that the, uh, the work was not consistent. 
when the demand for coal went down, they stopped mining it. They shut the mines down when the demand was low. And of course, the workers didn't get paid when they were out of work. Um, and this just was another factor that made the life of being a coal miner um, not all that much fun. Uh, you know, this kind of economic instability caused by the market. But, so I started looking in the newspapers and stuff, and I thought, well, why didn't they just build giant storage areas? And what I found was that really beginning in the 1890s, they started to. Uh, and here in Philadelphia, uh, here is, uh, by 1920, here is this absolutely enormous uh, coal storage facility that they built um, uh, in, around Philadelphia. All right, so um, now to go back to the history a little bit, of course, here's our founding father of the Lehigh Valley Railroad, uh, Asa Packer. Uh, and of course, I love this thing. Uh, uh, this is one of the murals that's in the Hotel Bethlehem. And it says, you know, Asa Packer, once a breaker boy, a pioneer in canal and rail transportation, envisioned the rise of Lehigh University, uh, which he founded to leadership in technical education. There weren't, when he was a young man, there weren't any coal breakers. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, when, when, when Packer ran for governor in 1869, he ran as a self-made man. Uh, and and that, that was a relatively new word in America. Um, and, uh, but everybody wanted to be a self-made man. So they kept trying to, in your biographies, in fact, you know, Packer didn't, Packer didn't leave much in the way of a paper trail. Uh, much of what we know about his biography came from his, his campaign for governor because they used his biography. His main campaign speech was his biography. And again, the self-made man. And the further back we could push him, you know, the, the poorer and the, and the less educated he was, the more self-made he was. Reminds me, there was an old Monty Python skit once about these old British gentlemen sitting around and each one of them trying to say how they had had a, a tougher life than the other one. And of course, in true Monty Python fashion, it just becomes ridiculously absurd. <laughs> uh, but, but so for the Ace Packer, we had to take him back to being a breaker boy. Uh, this, is a, uh, this, is a, this is a stereo view that also went for about $100. Uh, it's just, it's, I really think it's a wonderful photograph. Of, these are a bunch of breaker boys on break, uh, hanging out at, at the coal mine. Of course, then uh, they were one of the great jobs of all time, uh, being a child there, picking out the pieces of slate um, as the coal comes down underneath your feet, uh, picking out the pieces of slate uh, out of the coal. With an aided decent wage. What do you think? <laughs> Why would you pay them a decent wage? They're children. <laughs> They're helping the family, you know? The family's got to, you know, I mean, dad works, mom works, everybody works. All right, and of course, the, the guy, I mean, Packer, Packer basically uh, was more or less a finance guy. Um, you know, the guy that really did all the work for Packer was Robert Sayer. Uh, you know, he was in charge of building the railroad. Uh, he was also in charge of, um, of basically running the railroad. Uh, he, uh, Sayre left a 50-year uh, a diary, uh, which includes the weather every single day. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, it's like a pocket diary um, where it, he, he, he talks about a lot of things and whom he met. but. Uh, I mean, he was a very busy man trying to get this railroad, uh, trying to get this railroad up and running and then making sure that it ran, uh, ran well. He also wrote all the annual reports for the company and they are uh, very well written, really, very, very good documents. Okay, so, um, you know, as the, you know, the canal, you know, the coal industry had flourished with the canals beginning around 1830. Uh, to uh, the early 1850s, um, and, uh, and then we start to have the railroads, the Lehigh Valley Railroad, and uh, you know, basically at this point, the market would take all the coal they could, they could buy. So they didn't have to worry about trying to match supply with demand, 
because the demand was there. Um, and also, uh, you know, they were the only railroad um, in the Lehigh Valley uh, to move the coal. And of course, the business was good. Uh, the Civil War was wonderful. Uh, you know, the government kind of fixed prices. Uh, the, the, the industry in the North boomed during the war. Uh, they moved a lot of coal during the war, and uh, they made a lot of money. Uh, now, this is a really interesting thing about, uh, about 19th century capitalism. Uh, for one thing, here, 1865 was such a good year that they gave the, the, uh, the stockholders a 20% dividend. Uh, and of course, with Asa Packer's share of the company, which I think he owned about 25% of the stock, that meant that his share was $350,000. So thank, you know, Lehigh University, uh, you know, he, that, in that year he, he promised to give $500,000 to, uh, to found Lehigh University. So it wasn't much more than a one year's dividend um, that he had to give uh, in order to found the university. But the other interesting thing here is about, you know, today when you buy a stock, when most people buy stocks, uh, they're looking for the, for the company to grow, for the assets of the company to grow, which will increase the value of the stock. Well, that was somewhat true in the 19th century, but what, what the stockholders really wanted was dividends. And so what we see here uh, on the bottom here, the total, the total uh, profit for the year of 1865 was $1.6 million. Uh, not bad. But look at this, on the gross receipts, uh, you know, out of a total, uh, I mean, you're looking at a 50% profit, right? They made a 50% profit on sales in 1865, 50% profit. What did they do with that money? It went to the stockholders. But 1.3 million of, of the money went to the stockholders. And this is an important aspect of 19th century capitalism that I think we don't always appreciate. The, the investors in the railroads and other industries, they wanted dividends. Uh, they wanted big dividends every year. Um, and the big dividends were responsible for keeping the stock price up. Now, of course, as a modern person, I would say, well, the cheapest money for, for um, investing in your business is retained earnings, uh, right? That's your money, you don't have to pay interest on it. But the railroads really didn't think that way. When they needed money to expand, they borrowed it. They, they issued bonds. Uh, and of course, the interesting thing about the bonds is that doesn't really dilute the dividends that the stockholders get. If you sell stock, then there's more, there's more shares of stock out there competing for the same profit. Uh, if you sell bonds, well, all you got to do is pay the interest on your bonds. But then this is, this is kind of the deal with the devil in the railroad industry, right? If you sell a lot of bonds and you have interest payments that are due, and if you can't meet those interest payments, you're, you're, you're bankrupt. Uh, you get taken over. Uh, so that's why, you know, most of the railroads eventually in America did go bankrupt. Okay, so in this era, what you had was regional cooperation. Uh, you know, Asa Packer built a railroad from, uh, from Mock Chunk, Jim Thorpe, down to Easton. So then what are you going to do? Well, he had to hook up with other railroads. Uh, this is a connection that shows in Easton, where there would be another railroad heading off to New York, uh, the Central Railroad of New Jersey, and another railroad heading down the Delaware River. And of course, what's interesting also about this is, you know, that, that the railroads cooperated with each other. You know, Asa Packer really struggled to build this railroad. You know, it's, uh, you know he really didn't have enough money, though. He didn't have the million and a half dollars he needed to, uh, to build this railroad. So he needed, he needed to get money. Um, and from 1852, when they really started on the railroad, until about 1857, when it really got going, Packer was scrambling for money. Um, and in fact, this is where he made, uh, in 1854, he was so desperate for money, he had gotten involved in a business venture in Philadelphia, which was kind of interesting too, because Packer was selling a lot of coal to Philadelphia 
um, in the 1840s from the canal boats. Uh, but, but his main competitor, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company, uh, was also selling a lot of coal to Philadelphia. Well, they told the broker, the people that dealt with the coal once it got to Philadelphia, the, um, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company told them, we don't want you shipping Asa Packer's coal. You're only going to ship our coal or you're not going to ship any. So these guys then went to Asa Packer and said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll set up a dummy corporation and we'll ship your coal through the dummy corporation. We'll still be controlling it, but the Lehigh Valley Railroad people won't know uh, that we're still shipping your coal. Good job, Rod. No, no. So what, but, the, but why this becomes important is, uh, so Packer becomes a partner with these guys. When he's desperate for money in 1854, he hands these guys a contract to, to um, give them 20% of the value of the ownership of the railroad for $200,000. Well, what do these guys do? Uh, they, put the, they put this thing in a safe. Three years later, they brought it back out and signed it and said, we're 20% we're owners of the railroad. Uh, this case was finally decided in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in 1883. It was one of the longest, most expensive court cases in American history. The records for this, the records from this have been published, they're about this long. Uh, um, but uh, ultimately, what did the judge say? We don't know when that thing got signed. Uh, there were no witnesses. It was signed with a different kind of ink. Uh, it seemed to me they didn't need 30 years to figure that out, uh, that these guys were trying to capitalize on his fame. You know, but there were a few problems uh, with, regional, with this regional cooperation. The Erie Railroad was built to a different gauge. It was built to a wider gauge than the Lehigh Valley Railroad. So the Lehigh Valley Railroad cars couldn't run on the... Uh, they couldn't run on the Erie. Of course, this would be taking coal to Buffalo, where it could be then loaded into ships and taken to Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, you know, the whole Midwestern market. So they came up with this clever thing here where the, where the cars from the one railroad would go over the top and they would drop the coal by gravity into the cars from the other railroad uh, on the different gauge so that the, uh, you know, the coal could be carried by Erie cars. Uh, to Buffalo, and of course this probably annoyed uh, people uh, at the Lehigh Valley uh, considerably. But of course over the course of, of 18, from the early 1870s and 1902, what the Lehigh Valley Railroad decided to do was to basically stop cooperating and just build their own line. Build their own line from eastern New York City, build their own line uh, all the way up to Buffalo. And of course, in order to do this, they had to borrow a lot of money. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was a major expansion of the railroads. But unfortunately, uh, this sort of led to the era of ruinous competition. Um, and one of the guys who really started this was the infamous Franklin B. Gowan, uh, who was the head of the Reading, the Reading Coal Company, the Reading, uh, the Reading Railroad, uh, and Gowan started buying up railroad lands uh, in the 1870s. Uh, and of course, he's also famous because he was the prosecutor of the Molly Maguires. Um, and of course, the interesting thing too is in 1885, he uh, committed suicide um, in Washington, D.C. And I've always wondered if maybe the Mollies, maybe the Mollies had gotten their revenge on the, uh, <laughs> on him. But that, the reason was his railroad really went bankrupt. Because again, he, he went out and he spent all this money. He spent all this money and uh, at a time when the business was getting more competitive. Uh, and of course, the Lehigh Valley Annual Report of 1870 said, you know, the coal territory of, Wy of the Wyoming field is fast being absorbed by the northern companies. In a few years, there will be no individual operators at work. This makes it necessary to secure by purchase or long leases sufficient coal lands to supply the Lehigh Valley with tonnage in the future. So what gets set off here is this frantic scramble by the coal companies in order to secure uh, leases for future coal. 
Um, and some of these leases, I mean, the guys who own the coal lands made out like bandits. Uh, some of these guys, they demanded royalties, annual royalties, even if the coal was not being mined. Uh, you know, the, the, the railroads made some very bad deals. Uh, they made some very bad deals, but they were desperate. They were terrified that the day would come when they didn't have any coal to ship and they didn't own any coal. So there was this intense competition uh, for, to get the coal lands. And of course, what you have then is you have various other railroads being built. In 1869, the Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company, you know, why didn't they build a railroad? Why did Packer, why did Packer have to go and build his own railroad? The Lehigh Coal and Navigation Company had tons of money in the 1850s. Why didn't they build it? It's a good question. Uh, but I guess they didn't think that the railroad was going to be a competitor. But by the 1860s, they went, uh-oh, um, we better get a railroad. So they do build a railroad uh, up into the, on the other side of the river, um, up, in, up to Mock Chunk. And what you have is that everybody wants to have their own railroad where they don't have to interchange with anybody else. And so what you have is this huge amount of competition. Um, and of course, the, the anthracite market. Um, it continued to grow. Uh, during this period, but as I said, linear growth but exponential decline. Uh, you know, and of course, capitalism wants exponential growth. Capitalism does not like linear growth. Uh, between 1860 and 1870, the market doubled. Between 1870 and 1880, it doubled again. But between, it, it, the next time for doubling was between 1880 and the year 1900. The, the rate of growth of the industry fell in half between 1880 and, and, 19, and, uh, and 1900. Okay, so what you had was intense competition. And also in the 1870s, you had the economy uh, not being in very good shape. Uh, of course, the American economy did what the railroads did. And of course, Jay Cook, uh, the guy who had financed the Civil War, uh, for the Union was going to build the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, he took all of his money that he had in order to invest in that railroad. When they ran into the, to the uh, Lakota Sioux and Sitting Bull um, and Crazy Horse in the 1870s, it sort of became difficult to build the railroad through, uh, through that part of Montana and uh, Wyoming. Um, and in 1873, Jay Cook's went bankrupt, uh, which caused a national uh, panic. Uh, the economy collapsed. And so the 1870s was not a great, the 1870s was not a great time for business. Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, Robert Sayre uh, reporting in 1879. This year will be the largest year of production of coal that there's ever been. And next year we're gonna produce even more. And then he said, there being no arrangement made during the year by the production companies for limiting production to demand, and the result has been an unprecedented amount of coal mined, transported, and sold at ruinously low rates. It would seem as though the desideratum saw it was a large business, irrespective of profits, and this, no doubt, in most cases, has been attained. Uh, there were attempts in the 1870s to create um, cartels where all the coal companies would get together and decide to split up the business among themselves. But of course, uh, as Andrew Carnegie once said, the cartels were ro ropes of sand. Uh, everybody cheated on them. Uh, and so they, they were not successful in limiting competition. So what you have is all these companies producing as much coal as they can. Um, and, they, and they're losing money. On every pound of coal they, they sell in mine, they lose money. Um, and then also in 1879, Asa Packer died. Uh, and uh, a few interesting things, he was worth $7 million uh, when he died, uh, not the $50 million that, uh, some people, that some people in the press claim. Uh, but the other interesting thing is, he, he left his, his estate, he put it into a trust. I'm sure his three children love that. I uh, said that they, they expected to get the money, but he put it into a trust um, and he put, um, 
he put Elisha Packer Wilbur, um, his uh, his nephew, um, in charge in charge of the railroad uh, and in charge of the trust. Then uh, in 1891, we have another issue that comes up with the railroads, and that is. Uh, Sir, the unequal demand for anthracite coal largely restricts the production for two thirds of the year, while the producing transportation capacity of equipment must be maintained for the active season. You know, so what he's saying here is we have to have enough cars, we have to have enough, enough, you know, people and locomotives and cars for the peak, which is going to come in the winter. But what about the rest of the year? The rest of the year, our equipment is underused. So what you're what they're saying here is you have an enormous capital investment that you're not you're not you're not using fully and you're not getting as much out of it and this is you know that's where we get to the storage problem I think once you start to solve the storage problem this becomes less of an issue um, so the coal companies then in order to keep their cars full they start investing in the coal mines themselves. Um, now, the Lehigh Valley uh, invested in coal mining, and they found out that you could lose money mining coal as much as, as you could shipping it. Um, and of course, the interesting thing, too, is that when you make your business more complicated like this, where now you're just you're mining coal and you're shipping it, uh, how do you assign the cost? How do you know how your business is doing? Are you losing money on mining the coal, or are you losing the money on shipping it? Uh, to keep your shipping rates up and slice the, 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 the cost of the coal, or do you slash your, you know, it, it makes the business much more complicated, but in this case also, uh, it turned out to be a, a disaster, particularly for the Lehigh. All right, and this shows some of the, some of the coal companies here. Uh, and you can see here, down here, why Franklin Gowan probably committed suicide, uh, renting. A coal and iron company lost $14 million in mining coal uh, during this period. Uh, the Lehigh didn't do so great either. All right, so so the the, the uh, Wilbur had a very difficult time being president of, of the Lehigh Valley Railroad. Uh, business was not doing very well. And in 1892, uh, the workers went on strike. And what, what Wilbur did was, he basically fired all the workers, and he hired all people that didn't know what they were doing. And they basically pretty much destroyed the railroad uh, with a number of, of terrible wrecks. And there's, there's one, uh, one particular one I like here, um, where, where basically, um, Okay, um, one accident of near farcical um, nature involved uh, the private inspection engine used by President Wilbur's son. On December 2nd, engine number 192 was en route from Easton to assist in a wreck on the New Jersey division when it came upon a stalled train uh, east of Phillipsburg. Expecting a collision, the engineer and fireman leaped from the cab after putting the engine in reverse. Stopping short of the train ahead, the abandoned locomotive accelerated in reverse and headed back to Phillipsburg at 60 miles per hour. <laughs> there it collided with the with the door with with another engine um, and continued on across the Delaware River Bridge, uh, pushing the other engine, uh, pushing the other engine with it. After passing the Easton Station in tandem, the the runaways met in a, an eastbound train head on. The impromptu excursion ended abruptly. Uh, it was uh, the press had a lot of fun, uh, uh, so things were things were not going well uh, at this point. And uh, in doing some research, uh, I was once asked to do a talk on Lehigh and the uh, and the Episcopal Church. And so I was doing some research, and I found a biography written by a, a an Episcopal uh, minister named uh, named Elwood Worcester. And I start looking in the book, and at one point he talks about when he came to Bethlehem, he got invited to a dinner at somebody in Wilbur's group 
uh, to a dinner, and he explains how they drank themselves. He said it started off civilly, but as they as they drank more and more, um, they started to bellow and make noises like elephants, um, and <laughs> fell on the floor where they were scooped up uh, by their servants and taken home. And he said, and then he said, I saw these men on the street several days later, and they were as dignified as ever. Uh, so the, the stress uh, in the 1890s, of course, the stress was really getting was really getting to them. Uh, all right, and so what ultimately happens, right? In, in 1896, uh, the the railroad was facing a financial crisis. What Wilbur was doing. Uh, the, the, the trust, the Asa Packer Trust, I think had about 15% of the stock of the railroad. Wilbur wanted to have the railroad own more of its own stock. He was buying stock on the market using the stock in the trust as collateral. Um, and he was hoping to pay off the debts with the dividends, the profits. Well, in 1895 and 1896, there were no profits. There were no dividends and Wilbur owed money. Uh, you know, he, he owed a lot of money um, on his loans, and he didn't have the money. So they had to go to J.P. Morgan in Philadelphia. And Morgan said, I would be more than happy to loan you the money. All I want is control of your railroad. Uh, you know, I want a few seats on your board. Uh, and uh, Morgan gave him the money, and uh, Morgan gave him the money, and uh, kicked Wilbur and all his other buddies off the board and set in his own management team. And of course, what's interesting, what happens after that is that uh, the Lehigh Valley had not been investing enough money in the railroad, um, and Morgan had tons of money. So what we see over the next few years is that Morgan is pouring a lot of money into this railroad and bringing it up to speed. And then uh, after 1900, the Lehigh Valley uh, was a, a quite a successful railroad. Uh, for much of the 20th century, uh, thanks to uh, Morgan taking it over. You know, and I, I really think, you know, J.P. Morgan, you know, he was responsible for basically the formation of, of AT&T, General Electric, DuPont, U.S. Steel, you know, and his vision, his vision was ru com ruinous competition is stupid. Uh, and, and all these capitalists are are competing ruthlessly and they're just killing each other. But in a modern economy, what we really want is efficiency. Uh, we want businesses that run efficiently. Um, and so by combining companies and limiting competition uh, and creating enough money for investment, enough profits to go into investment, uh, we can have a, a very profitable uh, economy. So, my final slide. Uh, one of my favorite uh, novelists is Frank Norris. Uh, he, he, he wrote a, a trilogy um, in the early 20th century about wheat. Uh, and the first book in this trilogy is called The Octopus. It's a story of people growing wheat um, in California and basically their struggles with the railroad um, and how basically the railroad is, is, is really making it very difficult for them to make any money. They're gonna lose their land. Well, Frank Norris, uh, in the process of writing this book, he actually had an audience with, um, with Harriman, with Ed Harriman, uh, the head of the, uh, of the uh, Central Pacific Railroad. And when he went to see Harriman, he did not see some J.P. Morgan-like guy. Harriman was like this monastic guy who worked all the time. So he finds Harriman in a small office with a pile of papers this high, just working and working and working. And Norris is going, well, wait a minute, I thought this guy's, these guys are supposed to be evil. They're supposed to be these, these pompous, you know, what's wrong, what's wrong here? And so he goes back and what he does in the book, he basically comes to the conclusion that, um, that, that the railroad might indeed be a force only which no man could control, for which no man was responsible. Uh, so it isn't that, that humans had created the railroad. It's almost like a Frankenstein story, right? Humans had created the railroad, but the business was so complicated um, and so and so diverse that no one really had control of it. 
And nobody really understood it. So he basically comes up with the idea, well, it's, it's nature. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it's just like a hurricane or, or a tornado. The railroad is just a force of nature. I'm not going to blame Harriman. I'm not going to blame the striking world. I'm not going to blame anybody because nobody, nobody's in control. Nobody really knows what the heck is going on with this thing. It's more or less, it's like on its own. All right, thank you. That was awesome.